Welcome back to the Kingdom for Charity Easter Edition 2015. I'm your host, Calum Leslie, with TJ Azumo QT Stan Sanders. Nearly got your name on there. Casting with me. It's hard to get right. It's hard to get right with the nickname. This is why I prefer not having a nickname. It's easier. It rolls off the tongue. Yeah. It's, it's my identity. You can't take away my identity. <laughs> we're, about ready. The key. we're about ready for our second game here, which is going to be Ecop versus Dog. And for me, this is actually... Uh, one of the games, the, the pick of the first round, really, in terms of the quality matchups we have for you here. We obviously just saw Jab get a quick victory 3-0 there against the face hunter of number guy if you missed it. And uh, once again, we're seeing very similar class lineups here, which we'll talk about in a second. But uh, TJ, talk about Dog for a second, because he's a player who maybe doesn't have as many high-profile appearances as other players, but is a player that if you ask other players, he they consider him to be one of the very best. Yeah, he's one of the most consistent players, I think, is a big thing. The consistency of, of how he performs is uh, what, what puts him above a lot of other players. Um, back from the beginning, from when Hearthstone was first officially released, this guy was placing top 10 in ladder every single season on both North American and EU. And uh, he was he was playing Druid long before people were playing Druid. He was playing Ramp Druid long before people were playing Ramp Druid. Uh, he's a creative deck builder as well. A lot of times he'll put tech cards in two weeks before you see other people, other players put tech cards in. Um, he also has a lot of experience. Uh, he recently went to China with Temple Storm uh, and competed in tournaments over there with them, which um, getting that sort of international tournament experience, uh, even though Hearthstone, since a lot of the decks are posted online, you know, net decking is a huge thing. Um, it, it going to other regions and especially Asia who have a little bit of a different style they play a little bit different classes priest and shaman are 10 times as popular uh, on the Asian servers than they are in North America and in Europe it gives you a broader um, spectrum look on how to play Hearthstone and uh, so that type of experience is something that you, you not a lot of other players can say that they have and so that's what separates dog and both these guys are from two of the most respected esports organizations out there right now Dog being from Complexity, Ecop being from Cloud9. So um, these guys are definitely looking to prove things for their organization as well, which I always love to see the the big, the head honchos of esports organizations, their players battle it out because it's always always pretty cool. It adds an extra layer of, of competitive depth Absolutely. to the whole, the, whole th the whole thing. And Complexity is one of those teams which maybe isn't... Uh one of the, the, the huge teams in Hearthstone right now, but they have a lot of really good players. Uh, at the moment, really, the competitive players are just Show and Dog, obviously, Alchemix, uh, retiring last week. Uh, but, I mean, Show's been doing very well, getting to uh, doing very well in Seat Story Cup. Both Show and Dog doing very well in the KPL. Uh, Dog missed his matchup last week, so didn't uh, drop down a place in the KPL, is now kind of battling it around at 4-3, where Show is uh, currently in second place in his, in his division in the KPL. So, Complexity... Really, the surprise package of the KPL season so far, uh, in terms of how they're how well they're achieving, and Dogs will be looking to carry that over here. As you said, was you know handpicked by Temple Storm to be their extra player to go into China with them, and they, you know, they had, they obviously had their three players, but they could pick basically anyone yeah. to come with them that was available, and they picked Dog because they knew he was a really good player, and he did very very well for them in China. But yeah, uh, they had they had to pick the closest thing to Magic Amy as they could. That's Dog. <laughs> it's obvious. It really is. I'm not. I'm not touching that. But uh, <laughs> Ecot does have a number of big wins under his belt, of course, as well. Here is a card's 2014 Cup three, the initial Hearth Stats Invitational, the very first uh, Take TV Hearthstone Invitational. Hasn't necessarily won anything in the past maybe six months, but does always have good showings. He won the uh, the Ding It Showdown series recently, a minor tournament. So shows he is capable of winning against top players as well in Europe. And this is going to be an interesting test for Ecop to see if he can. Uh, get past Doggy, as you say, is regarded as one of the, the really, really strong players, particularly in the North American scene. So looking at the class lineups we have for these guys, uh, again, two classes the same with one class different. Ecop is bringing uh, Mage, Warlock, and Paladin, while Dog is bringing Mage, Warlock, and Rogue. Paladin's an interesting choice right now. Yeah, Paladin, um, interesting choice, but I think it's strong. And I think it, it's going to get stronger as more Dragon cards are released, more Dragon Synergy cards are released. Um, Dragon Consort, of course, is available for these players to use, which is the the new card from from Blackrock Mountain, from the Blackrock Spire Wing, I believe, of Blackrock Mountain. It's the Absolutely. five mana five five dragon that reduces your next dragon played by, uh, I believe, three mana. 
it reduces it by either three mana or two, or two mana. So it's really strong uh, because there's a lot of strong dragons in the game, even right now. Even using your dragon consort to make your next dragon consort cheaper, if those are the only two dragons in your deck, it's actually still a pretty strong card because a 5-5 yeah. five, five body for five minute is, is strong. Sometimes you play Lotheb on curve, not even for the effect, just because that body, I mean, it matches up against Sludge Belcher. Um, it it matches up against the six drops, like if he plays Emperor Thorson on turn six. Um, and that extra, extra benefit that it gives you, it doesn't go away. So it's, it's always going to be there. And so if you do have any dragon in your deck, it, it's going to be pretty good. But I really think Mage and Warlock are going to be the two core classes that we see from a lot of players. Just because those two decks right now, they're so versatile. And they're also really strong. Uh, you can we talked about it earlier with Warlock, Zoo Lock, Demon Lock, Mid Range, Zoo Hybrid, Handlock, Traditional Handlock, Demon Handlock, and then um, for Mage, there's Temple Mage, Mech Mage, Grinder Mage, Freeze Mage. Like both those classes are so versatile and and so powerful right now in the current meta that I I think not picking both Mage and Warlock or not picking either Mage and Warlock for your lineup. Uh, in the current meta is is probably a mistake so really happy to see these guys line up that's a fair call i i do think um this is something that i think really speaks to the spot that hearthstone's in right now is such a great place is that really there isn't any class that i don't think is viable particularly in the conquest format uh I agree. well i think probably some classes are still stronger than others so i'm not sure how we'll see the paladin do it can get, really do well it can get some big wins and you know if we see a dragon paladin here i guess ecop will get a moral victory just from bringing a dragon paladin for me but uh yeah. the rogue for for dog could be very interesting he's a very very strong rogue player um again it'll be interesting to see if maybe he's brought something new maybe a a fatigue mage with gang up trying to fatigue his opponent but uh it could well be just a more traditional oil rogue which is still super super strong yeah i think we're gonna see freeze mage oil rogue handlock for, for dog um he has been playing quite a bit of zoo um i also saw him playing the mid-rangey demon zoo that we saw earlier from jab as well uh you you, you have bigger hitting cards like dr boom we saw bane of dooms we saw malganis you have cards like that but you still have like the core of zoo which now includes the imp gang boss which is ridiculous amounts of value from that card the two four for three by itself is pretty strong i mean it's a, it's a good body for its mana cost and you're guaranteed at least one imp from it unless it's silenced which if you're using a silence on just a naked imp gang boss then you, you've you're probably already too far behind to to be able to come back so um super super strong deck i, I am curious to see if ecop is going to be running those dragon cards because i played against uh dragon paladins a couple times on ladder last night after the BRM was was released and people had time to get used to it in in NA and I actually lost every single game that I played against it yesterday <laughs> which I mean of course it's a small sample size I believe it was three or four games but that's it's the amount of tempo that you can gain from being able to play your dragons earlier even just your second dragon consort is r really huge so all right, well, our first match is going to be those two variant decks, the Paladin and the Rogue, going to be hitting up against each other now, and uh, the Rogue could do very well against things like the those Silverhand Recruits. This could be a pretty good matchup for Dog Keeper. We're going to get into it. Eco versus Dog, game number one. Yeah. yeah, this is traditionally a pretty poor matchup for Paladin. Uh, rogues just have so many tools to deal with it, to deal with Paladins currently. A lot of rogues have been cutting uh, one of their fan of knives. They've been running one fan of knives because in most other matchups, it can actually sometimes be a liability to have them in your hand. Sometimes you use it just to cycle, which doesn't feel bad because it's three mana, kind of expensive. Um, but it's still, even just having one can sometimes turn the tides against Paladin. Blade Flurry is always strong against them. When they, It's really hard for them to play Tyrion safely because usually it's just going to get sapped big big tempo move for rogues so uh, we'll have to see if um if ecop is going to be able to pull this one out but it's going to be a tough road absolutely we can get to the mulligans here and see what these guys are playing again looks fairly standard from dog we see the tinker sharp sword oil antique heel bot which probably won't be a huge factor in this 
battle, though it could help him to kind of stay with the Paladin. Paladin does have a lot of uh, staying power. He can't, does often run a lot of healing as well. We see just full mulligan there from Ecop. Lots of his top end cards, not really what he needs. That's a bit more like it. Does have the se double Sengen Shieldmaster. And those golden Sengens are, are pretty, pretty, quite pretty there from Ecop, certainly. Yeah. And these two guys, if, if competitive Hearthstone had superlatives, like voting superlatives, like you did in high school, then these two players would be voted most likely to be cast as supervillains in <laughs> movies. They both look like they could be super villains, especially when like their camera gets blacked out when it's not their turn. What I really like here is that it appears that Ecop may have an all golden deck, and with no golden hero, and Dog has a golden mm. hero with no golden cards. Yeah. Does that tell us something about the psychology of the players? Well, if you're really trying to min max, unless you have all golden cards in your deck, then you don't want to play any golden cards. Because it, it makes your opponent, it gives your opponent a slight advantage sometimes because they know that, um, like, if you play a golden card in one game and then a non golden card in the next game, they know you have two copies of that card, which usually isn't going to be that big of a deal. But if you're really trying to min max and try and gain as much of advantage as possible, then that's the way to go. So, uh, unless Ecop does not have an all golden deck, his quartermaster is not golden. So, I don't know. He's a tryhard, but he's not enough of a tryhard. It's, uh, yeah, you know, you do always have to try hard, but we do see from there from Ecop, looks like the Quartermaster not golden. And that's, uh, so you got to call that a misplay there, really. Mm -hmm. Not having the, the full Lack of golden preparation. deck. Now, really we, saw, we saw the Knife Juggler come out there from, uh, from Ecop really early, and I get the idea of playing something early, but against a Rogue, there are just so many ways that you can kill that early Knife Juggler. is. That, that often feels like a really difficult decision, and it's not something I guess Ecop would have wanted to do, kind of sacrificing the knife juggler like that. But it's it can be a, a good bit of tempo for Dog, but that Senjin coming down, and actually there's not a huge amount of good stuff in his hand here. Yeah, um, backstab deadly poison is a way to deal with it. Um, and I think that might be the only clean way to do it. Uh, even though you're you're sort of giving up a lot of your turn, you're not using your mana that efficiently. Uh, it sets you up to where you can clear quite a big board the next turn with Blade Flurry. Um, yeah, and that's the the only play. And this is an interesting deck for me, Cop. Uh, Sentient Shieldmaster is a card that a lot of Paladin players will say is a card that you can substitute in depending on the meta. But it's really a card that's not played very much nowadays because. Sludge Belcher is really strong. It comes out a turn later. It's so much stickier than Ascension Shield Master. And a lot of Paladins will opt to play like a Paladin Shredder instead, just because it's a lot tougher to remove. Yeah, we do see the... Uh, yeah, he's going to have to use the Deadly Poison's Dagger here. Swing. To kind of a waste of that there with the Eviscerate. We did use, need to use the Deadly Poison to activate the Eviscerate. It's not the most efficient trade. And you see the next engine come out there. That's going to feel pretty bad if your dog, you probably, I mean, you do have the second Eviscerate, but I guess you can backstab Eviscerate here, but you might actually just opt to, yeah, he's just going to opt to Coin Sprint. They can use the backstab and the dagger to clear this engine. That's definitely not a bad spot for yeah. uh, for playing that sprint. Would have wanted to prep it, but turn, pointing it out on turn six is, that's not too bad either. And it uh, doesn't, doesn't go ahead and kill this engine in the end. No, you have, you definitely have a lot of wiggle room uh, here as the rogue player against the paladin because paladins uh, they 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 ramp up over a certain amount of time. Um, they have a couple of sh strong play turns like muster for battle quartermaster. But if you take a turn to sprint or if you take a turn to draw cards, you're not going to be in in too much trouble just because they're not going to have crazy turns where they just burst you down from a, a super high amount. You have a little bit of time to work with. And um, so he can take the time to sprint there, make sure that he gets a big hand, because he knows that there's nothing a paladin can do that's gonna like lock him out from being able to like clear whatever board that he has. Maybe with the exception of Lotheb. Um but that would be really the only only card that would punish him for not really building a board during the during his turn. Yeah, and Ecop's gonna get the quartermaster down here with double muster in hand. That feels again that doesn't feel like. 
maybe the play he would have wanted to make because it does mean that he that's one potential muster quartermaster down particularly sitting on turn seven i mean that would have been a great play on turn eight but uh like you said giving the rogue time which is the paladin just doesn't have much burst it doesn't have a huge amount of threat that just hits the board really quickly it gives the rogue a lot of time to maneuver and that's really what you don't want to give these rogue decks is time to maneuver and set up things like a massive blade flurry and you can see here this is just going to completely clear ecop's board yeah i like that play um it might seem wasteful to use the the deadly poison as just a way to make your blade flurry stronger but he would have either had to use the backstab or the deadly poison and later in the game both of those tools they sort of deal two damage themselves deadly push you can say that it does four but immediately and big backstab is actually easier to combo with it can make for some a lot stronger turns later in the game where you don't where you want to make a really strong turn but don't have as much mana to work with so um i like their opting to go with the deadly poison even though it might seem a little wasteful as opposed to going with just the backstab and leaving part of the quartermaster alive he wants to protect that violet teacher as much as he can yeah, it's, uh, it's it's difficult to make these calls, as you say, particularly with the Rogue, and just having very specific resources that you want to be using at very specific times. But Emperor Thorison looks like it's going to come down here from Dog, and in Rogue, this card, this card can just be absolutely killer in reducing the mana cost of these cards. And every deck can be absolutely <laughs> this is true. killer. Even if, you're just, Rogue. even if you just have three cards in your hand, and you're just reducing the cost of three cards... That's basically stronger than an Innervate, even if it dies the next turn. Because you're opening up more mana than your next turn than an Innervate would have. So the value of that card is just ridiculous. Of course, you can only have one, unlike Innervate, where you can have two. It's still just anything above three or four cards in your hand is just absurd amounts of value, especially in Rogue. Because later in the game, it'll allow him to make oh, the, the most disgusting turns ever, which... Oh man, it's it's crazy what you can do with Emperor Thorsan in a big hand. Yeah, I mean this feels pretty good for Dog right now. Obviously getting that body on the board. Uh Elder Peacekeeper Equality, a couple of tools that Ecop has to deal with it. I guess he can decide he's yeah, probably just gonna go ahead and use the equality. Elder Peacekeeper uh would reduce its uh, potency and attack, but that's not the real threat of the Thorison. So uh, yeah. <laughs> the equality this is a pretty good board for quality. And uh, you might even, he's going to go for a muster for battle here, I think probably with the knife juggler and try and kill it with a juggle. That's always, an, always, we talked about style points earlier, killing things with the knife juggler, always good. Yeah. And a lot of times you want to wait till there's a little bit bigger of a board. Um, or before you use second muster, make sure that you, yeah, I don't think he's going to use a second muster here. But he might. To be honest, I wouldn't. Because I'd want to wait. If he's running a second quartermaster, I would try and wait. Because this would play like directly into a fan of knives play. Which he used sprint earlier. So it's actually pretty likely that he'd have it. So, um, yeah. Not surprised that he decides to go with Aldar Peacekeeper here. He's going to hope for the juggle on the... Nope. He only has to take one damage, but... Yeah, I guess that's okay. But it's, yeah, not being able to juggle... Into if he it. doesn't draw the AoE here, he might be in some trouble. Well, there's the blade flurry, like you said, and the spell power as well. Not to sound too much like Gara, but the spell power. Yeah. And in fact, the backstab as well <laughs> means he can clear this entire board. SI7 is an option. Again, you look at all the options in Dog's hand here. He just has so many weird ways to clear this board. He's going to go with a backstab, and uh, it might not even blade flurry here. It might just... Yeah, it looks like he's just going to kill off the two bigger minions. Mm -hmm. And I guess that is a risk when if Quartermaster could come down, if Ecop were to top deck a Quartermaster. But again, he does have options with Blade Flurry and the Spell Power that could shut that down. And there is the Dragon Consort. Wow. Yeah, we talked I, about it. Even if you're just running Dragon Consorts, I still think it's a strong card. Or even if you're just running Dragon Consorts and, say, one Azure Drake or Dragon Consorts and Ysera. It it just makes for such huge power plays because you can bring Ysera out on, what, turn six? Is it two less or three less? It's two less. Two less. Okay, turn, turn seven. seven. Or turn six with the coin. Or next turn, you can play a three-mana, another Dragon Consort, or a three-mana Azure Drake. Um, and you could have a three mana Azure Drake on turn seven, then a four mana three damage Consecrate. 
which is pretty absurd. Um, so the the combination that can do with that, even without many dragons, <laughs> right on time. That fan of knives top deck, that is insane. Fan of knives into an eviscerate. It doesn't even need the eviscerate. Could just use one of his three threes, but it's, uh, yeah, we're gonna see the low third, and then I think yeah, we're gonna see the dagger. I think we're gonna see the eviscerate here to clear this up. Yep, so he's going to use the Eviscerate to clear up the Dragon Consort, go all the way into face. And uh, this is starting to get actually quite out of hand. For Dog here is such a great board and just drew into those perfect options. Yeah. There's a Belcher that's going to slow things down a little bit, but I'm not sure that's going to be enough because the Sap is in hand. And there you go, there's the Concede from Ecop. So Dog goes up 1-0. I think that game may have been longer than our whole entire last series there, DJ. Yeah, that... <laughs> Seriously, face center all three games in this game. But uh, these games are a little bit more exciting. Uh, Dog in that last turn was actually one damage drop lethal with the Phantom Knives. Uh, he may not have thought about it, um, but he was actually really close with the South Sea Deckhand Blade Flurry. He actually had 18 damage, I believe. Um, but it looked like they didn't even look at it. It was pretty much a, a one game anyway. So that's going to be a quick start. I mean, that's just how that matchup usually goes. Unless the rogue just doesn't draw into any AOE, which is really unlikely because Sprint makes them get through their deck so quickly. I mean, Dog was already through more than half of his deck, so him just drawing Blade... He, he even had Blade Flurry. He didn't really even need the Phantom Knives there. It was just sort of uh, the, the icing on the cake there. Um, but usually they draw into their AOE timely enough to where they can deal with Mustard for Battle. Paladin has a really hard time building up a board that's immune. You sort of have to get really huge tempo swings early game, rely on the rogue not having AoE, and then have a big low depth turn to shut them down, and win basically the next turn. That's how you win as a paladin in that matchup. So it's really tough. Dog fortunate to match up against that in the first. Um, but we'll see. Uh, I, this is another rough matchup for Ecop. Uh, Hunter, this is probably a face hunter. And so... No, it's the uh, the mage for Dog, sorry. No, oh. I'm sorry, the icon or screen appears to be uh, wrong there. But yeah, it's going to be the Paladin of Ecop against the Mage of Dog. Okay. Um, okay. And as you said before, Mage is a very, very versatile archetype. Who knows what the Mage could be? Um, you predicted Freeze Mage. Mm -hmm. I think that's probably a safe bet. Mech Mage is also very strong, but who knows what we'll see from this Mage. And Paladin, uh, Ecop, I guess, you know, we talked about the strategy of Conquest already so much, but Paladin is possibly one of the difficult decks in his lineup to get the win with, so he needs to get that win as quickly as possible if he's going to win the series. Um, things didn't go too badly, just ran into a bad matchup with that Rogue, and he's going to be hoping for, for better things against the Mage. Yeah. Paladin, uh, Freeze Mage is, is really strong currently, because um, Emperor Thorsan makes for plays that weren't possible before. Um... Especially, there's a lot of there's a couple different variations of Freeze Mage now that are that can be viable. Uh, Emperor Thorson plus Malagos uh, in Freeze Mage is actually super strong because uh, you can Emperor um, Thorson if you have Malagos, Frostbolt, and Ice Lance in your hand, and it makes it so you can Malagos, Frostbolt, Frostbolt, Ice Lance, Ice Lance in the same turn, which is ab absurd amounts of damage. That's 16 plus it's over 30 damage you can't I think. even you can't even carry yeah it's so much I think it's I think it's yeah it's a ridiculous amount of damage I think it's like 32 damage which is absurd and I mean that combo may not be that likely but even if you just have two frostbolts in Icelands or a frostbolt and two Icelands uh, with Malagos if you can play Malagos on the same turn and do that just absolutely ridiculous amounts of burst burst that wasn't possible before in Freeze Mage. Um, the Malagos version may not be as popular, but Freeze Mage in general, just with that card, has uh, just increased in strength. Paladin, one of the decks that can deal with it pretty well, just because uh, usually they run quite a bit of heal. Uh, an anti heal bot and a lay on hands is not a strange thing to see in Paladin. Lotheb is a staple in Paladin decks. They can make big turns with pressure early on if they're. Um, if they can muster for battle quartermaster, they can put on a lot of pressure before the mage can deal with it. So, oh, there's a Nixia. So that's one of the dragons that Ecom's running apparently. Wow, that's uh, we didn't see that in the last matchup, but this is very definitely a dragon paladin uh, with some interesting options. But it's yeah, it's going to be a freeze mage. 
for dog we see the dibs there the hoarders that kind of betraying that a little bit but uh drawing to some better early game here from ecop the shielded mini bot that's going to be doing uh probably a lot of work for him against these early minions from dog but the board is very very unimportant for the <laughs> in this matchup against freeze mage uh freeze mage probably one of the more technical decks that we're seeing in in the most tournament play it's a very very different style of deck tj give us a little overview of how freeze mage works what freeze mage is looking to do and and what we're going to see in this matchup here in most matchups the biggest thing freeze mage wants to do is just draw through as much of their deck as possible freeze mage is not really playing against you they're playing against themselves you have to make sure that you fit your curve on every single turn. You have to make sure that you draw as many cards as possible while not overdrawing because all of your cards are crucial. And then your your win condition is basically Alex Straza into burst. And as long as you can get to Alex Straza, an Alex Straza turn safely with burst in your hand before your opponent can get you low enough to pop your ice block, you pretty much win the game. And against, against some decks, it can feel like an uphill battle against freeze mage it, sometimes it can even feel unwinnable because you're not really when you're playing against the freeze mage you're not really playing against something you're sort of just throwing your cards out there they get frozen you throw more cards out there they get frozen he throws doomsayer the counterplay is pretty low um but there are some things that you can do like saving your heals uh having timely low thebs um saving certain key cards like owl for uh doomsayers if you know that you're going to build up a board there's things you can do to increase your, the matchup but a lot of it comes down to whether or not the freeze mage is drawing and playing on point so it can be frustrating at times but it's it's Ooh, like you policy. said it's really technical deck to watch yeah well we see a lot of the key components of freeze already have dog uh, there's the pyroblast the alexstrasza those are two big finishers for turn nine and ten person is going to come down and that's actually going to change this matchup quite considerably just from the uh just from the uh, from the effect on the alexstrasza and the pyroblast that's going to make a big difference to the the win condition of this deck yeah throwing out the doomsayer on this turn um i mean he wants to reduce the pressure but ecop has to be a little bit happy about that just because um he knows that he's going to have a lot bigger pressure tools coming in in the next couple turns that are going to put even more pressure. Uh, equality is a good draw because he has to be able to deal with this Thor's Town. Because against Freeze Mage, you can't really afford to leave Thor's Town out for more than one turn. Because that means it, it makes for some huge plays that they can make later on. Um, Fireball costing three. Uh, even Pyroblast costing nine could make it so that you can power blast and if you had a frost bolt in your hand you could frost bolt and ice lance in the same turn with thor sand it just opens up so many combos that are just absolutely ridiculous if he left it alive for another turn he could power blast and ice block in the same turn which is absurd uh that's what that was like one of the main things that were gating mages from being able to take victory sometimes usually they're off by one turn they want to put out burst and ice block the same turn so they don't die but they can't so that card is just ridiculous in freeze mage yeah, we're going to see Anixia here, which uh, I guess that's a pretty good target for Flame Strike. This board full of whelps, but I don't think... I'm just going to see the Alex Straza come down here, perhaps. Mm -hmm. He's calculating his damage here. He's thinking, can I, um, can I burst him down over the next couple turns and still be able to take the brunt of this damage? And uh, the answer is most likely yes, because he does actually have 15 damage in his hand. He probably won't account for the heal bot. Um, but it's not really that risky of a play. He even has Frostbolt Ice Lance. It, this is looking really grim for Ecop. He's got to draw into like more points of heal plus second level them. Because uh, Alexstrasza has already been out, which an early Alexstrasza usually spells bad things. Yeah, he's going to go for Consecrate here with his uh, Storm minions to trade rather than the 8 8, which is, I guess, it's pretty good for keeping the, the larger body alive on his board. Can give more damage potential. Heal what's going to come down. That's uh, that's going to mess up what Dog was trying to do a little bit. He's able to pop this as well. No, there's no ice block right now. Yeah, he's still at 23 health or 25 health. Sorry. So this turn Ooh. he can pyroblast and play Doomsayer. Oh no, no, sorry, he's on nine now. Yeah, pyroblast this turn. Next turn he has um, Fireball, Frostbolt, Ice Lance. 
uh, which is 13 damage plus a ping, so 14. So unless he has points of heal, yeah, he's 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 dead this turn. So <laughs> that's game already on on turn 10. That's like almost the ideal curve that you can have as a freeze mage, being able to put bring out Emperor Thor's hand, reduce the cost of cards like your Alex Straza and your Pyroblast, and just being able to kill them, <laughs> kill them on curve, which is absurd. Yeah. As much damage on the board as possible here, but it's not going to be enough. And you see, even with the ice block coming into hand, which is usually really, really bad for freeze mage to be able to not to not be able to get those off mad scientists. This is actually going to be fear. Doesn't even need to have one of his ice blocks off, and he said, "Perfect lethal for the freeze mage," and exactly what the freeze mage needed to do. That's a bit too yeah, and. Um, I mean, he even had lots of damage in his hand to follow up from that. Even if he had lay on hands, he could have, at that turn, he had the reduced cost ice block. He could have ice blocked, frostbolt, ice lance, ping. The next turn, he could have double fireballed. There was just so many things that he could have done. And that's just um, how poor the that that matchup can sometimes be if the freeze mage draws well like i said it, it sometimes it doesn't even feel like you're you're playing against something like the freeze mage is just sort of playing against themselves they're playing against their own hand uh which yeah, is really rough yeah you see matches all the time where it looks like the freeze mage is dying and then the ice block comes at the perfect time and everything is fine um it's going to be the deck of dog is the final deck that he needs to uh, get a win with and we see dog doing very well here same kind of uh, strong performance he's had in the KPL, which you can watch, obviously, every Tuesday and Wednesday from 6.30 Central European time. About halfway through that now, we're going to have the playoffs at the start of next month uh, for £15,000, so the big lead in hearts ever, so make sure you're watching that as well. And in fact, this is going to be a Warlock mirror match. That's very interesting, and the archetypes are going to be all important here. Yeah, definitely. Um, just because... There's like sort of a rock, paper, scissors that goes on with Warlock decks. And actually with M, M Game Boss, I'm not actually sure how it works out. Um, but uh, Zoo usually struggles against Handlock if they can draw into some of their key cards. Um, Warlocks, uh, they do have more tools now. Most Warlocks are teching in either one power overwhelming or double power overwhelming. So later in the game, Zoo Locks can get through big walls. But if they put the, the Handlock low enough to where you can play Molten Giants and build up a wall, Sometimes that can just be the end of, of Zulok. Um, it's, a, it's actually a really skillful matchup because the, what the Zulok wants to... Oh, well, I guess what we... Um... You can stop talking about Handlock because we can see pretty much identical Zoo yeah. starts here for both Ecop and Dog. Uh, both yep. getting Argus and Implosion, but mulliganing away. Um, both managing to get one drops as well, which is pretty crucial. Yeah, the one drop for... Uh, Ecop being a little bit better. Flame Imp is probably the, is one of the ideal starts. And Imp Game Boss is actually a huge card in this matchup. Just because you want to put as much uh, as many annoying things on the board as possible. You want as much power on the board as possible every single turn. Uh, because usually the player that gets board control first, that gets overwhelming board control first in Zoo versus Zoo, it's going to be the player that wins. Because Zoo doesn't have a lot of comeback mechanics. Once they lose the board, it's really hard for them to gain it back because usually, I mean, sometimes they do. Uh, some zoo players do run a, a copy of Shadow Flame to make, uh, it's more like the mid-range zoos that run that, to make like a power warming Shadow Flame turn to, to come back. But Implosion is usually their only damage from hand spell that they can use to try and make it come back in the game. And a lot of times that's not enough in the mirror matchup. And um, we can see here the curve for both players uh, not the best. Uh, this turn, having to tap on turn two in a zoo mirror matchup usually isn't the, the best of options. He does have two Imp Gang bosses plus the Defender of Argus, which are all fantastic cards. Uh, getting that egg down and being able to have an activator for that egg like the Defender of Argus is also another big swing play in the matchup. Absolutely. And, There's so much going on here. The Sea yeah. Giant obviously in hand for Dog. Well, that could be absolutely uh, that could be killer in this matchup if the board gets flooded uh, on either side, in fact, or both sides. Just doubling gang, gang boss for Ecop, that new card, which is really making Zoo uh, a potent threat again. Yeah. And you see here, it, I mean, how do you deal with it? You can power overwhelming, but you're still going to be 
you're using that power of woman, which could be used as burn, um, and you're still giving him a 1 1 imp. Uh, but you have to be able to deal with this immediately, or else it can get out of control. Because let's say he didn't have power of woman here and he was forced to play like Echoing Ooze. And the, those one health creatures that the imp gang boss can just throw into, it's losing one health, but then it's spawning an imp. So it's it's basically gaining power for killing one of your creatures, which is pretty ridiculous amounts of value if you really think about it on the surface. And uh, there's the Void Caller. Void Caller, pretty standard now. Um, even if you don't have many demons, Void Caller is still a strong binding in itself. And um, no matter what kind of imp it summons, it's still going to give you more mana efficiency at the end of the day. And if it does bring out a Doom Guard, that's like ideal scenario. And it just gives you a huge, huge boost to your to your board strength. Yeah, I mean, even if it's something something like a flame imp, that can be really, really crucial in this matchup where your health's going going away that free health and can really increase the, the values of those of those flames later on in the game. Yeah. Alright, so this turns a little bit tougher. Uh, he doesn't have a clean way to deal with this wood color, but at the same time, I don't know if he necessarily wants to deal with the wood color yet. Uh, he doesn't know what's going to come out the other side. Sort of like Pandora's box. It, that There's that moment of panic when you kill a void caller and you don't have a way to deal with something big that comes out of it. And sometimes it, can, it just comes back empty. Sometimes it's, he's drawn blanks, but sometimes there's a doom guard on the end of that and you just lose the game from it, so... It's a really tough thing to deal with. Yeah, he was thinking about the Defender of Argus to, on these two losers, but he's going to go ahead and just use the, the Beast of Sergeant and the Gang Boss to fill up the board, get a bit of pressure in. He's running out of time a little bit, roping against here, but going to get it all in, I think. You're probably thinking, well, it's Zoo, why is he roping? Zoo for Zoo is actually a really tough matchup to play, because every single point of damage matters. When you're both playing the exact same decks, and you both have very similar starts, if one player makes a slight misplay, it opens up opportunities for the other player to really capitalize on it. And that's a lot A lot of times what happens in mirror matchups is one player makes one suboptimal play and that completely changes the, the course of the game. So not surprised that he's taking his time on his- Yeah, so you're, you're absolutely right. Mirror matches are, are kind of, I guess, different skill or the old RNG matches, whichever way you want to look at it. Yeah, that's true as well. When mirror matchups increases the the effect of randomness just a little bit more, because one player could get stuck with two doom guards and a power bombing as their opening hand, and the other guy has curves out like with flame imp, haunter creeper, imp gang boss. So, uh, but this game they both had pretty similar starts. Uh, this would be a very valuable sea giant. Yeah, one mana sea giant. That's a pretty good value. Uh... He's trying to, yeah, I guess he's going to pop that and see what comes out of the hand. Ooh, Can that might have been a misplay. Yeah, he, that was yeah. definitely a misplay. Yep, yep, look at his face. We yeah, can you're, it for sure. Your own minion dies as well when you trade, so it's going to cost two <laughs> less, not one less. Oh. Dog, uh, obviously shaken up about that. See, those are the things. I mean, if, imagine the strength of his board right now if he had an extra sea giant. Like, Ecob is already at 17 health. If that, all that Sea Giant has to do is swing twice. And this turn, he had nothing. He had two eggs. If he had a Sea Giant on board, that would basically be game over. And now, ah, uh, now it's going to be really rough. Well, he does have the double power overwhelming, which is a pretty good trade with the, the Sea Giant. It would definitely give him some options. But yeah, yeah. that was a definite misplay from Dog. A very uncharacteristic misplay. Um, you know, we talked about how good a player he is. We've seen him go very long in his turns, be thinking about his, his turns an awful lot. I mean, he's maybe going to play the Sea Giant, but uh, I'm pretty sure we're just going to see double power overwhelming here on probably these eggs, and then a void, and then a huge void terror as well. That could be a pretty good swing turn. Yeah, an early void terror is really something that's tough to deal with in Zoo, but uh, Sylvanas being played in this more mid rangey Zoo is a little bit interesting. Uh, it's kind of a slow card. Um, especially with this deck, because if you get caught with a, a um, like a slow hand early on, like a clunky hand early on, it can sometimes mean 
that you just lose the game from there. Because, again, like I said, you don't have comeback mechanics. And his hand is actually pretty poor. He does have the power overwhelmings to activate these eggs. He does have the Void Terror to activate the eggs. But as far as big creatures go, it, it's not the strongest. He will be able to clear up the Sea Giant here, which is really But it's... Yeah, so we're going to see the double power overwhelming. Um, actually, we're just going to see it on one. That's, uh, <laughs> that's not a huge difference. Okay. Wow. That's actually a, a huge, huge turn. Because he puts an 11-7 on the board, plus two two of those Nerubians. Yeah. I think the thing that was giving him pause there was the Sylvanas, because the Sylvanas versus plus power overwhelming is a huge turn. Yeah, um, he still on the Sea Giant. Yeah, Ecop's a big fan of uh, Sylvanas. Uh, as a card, so I know he was thinking long and hard about how he was going to play that, but this feels this was definitely too strong a board, I think, to turn down. Double Doom Guard for Dog now in hand, but this is a really difficult position to win from. Yeah. Um, even if he had, yeah, to be honest, looking at it like you said, even if he did play that C John on the one turn where he made that mistake, uh, he probably still would have been in just about this, the same position that he is now, because he did have the double power overwhelming, so... Uh, getting out that big Void Terror, uh, his hand is so clogged too with the double Doom Guards and um, no Void Caller to, to bring him out for free. He's most likely going to have to discard one of those Doom Guards in order to play the other one um, safely or for any use. And Dr. Boom comes out as well. This is this is what, one of the biggest boards that you'll see from, from a zoo. Yeah, I think he's he's going to go with the Nitro of Sylvanas instead. He save the Dr. Boom. Um, doesn't even need Dark Boom, just in terms of Vanus, and, and this is very, very happy cop dog can see where the the way you think. Yeah. And yeah, he's gonna be <laughs> he's gonna swing for eleven with this void tear. With a Sylvanas on the board. Um now he's thinking, is there any way that I could lose the next turn? And there actually is. If he Actually, no. With eight mana, there's not because he can't tap. Well, there is from for three cards. He could doom guard, not discard the two power overwhelmings, and kill him. But uh, that's very, very unlikely because he'd have to have exactly those cards. Oh wow! She decides to take the damage. And see, this is one of those situations where. Um, even if he gets rid of his Argon Squire and his Haunted Creeper to try and reduce the amount of cards that he's actually discarding, he's still going to discard the second Doom Guard in that situation. And even just playing a Doom Guard on the board is really not going to do much of anything. Uh, because, yeah, he's still dead next turn regardless. He could try and stop some of the damage while he can, but he needs to not discard his other doom guard in order to have any sort of chance of winning so i think the best play here is actually to just either tap and play a doom guard and hope that your second doom guard doesn't get discarded uh, so how much damage is staring at him on the board that's 18 19 23 28 <laughs> i don't think he could even take enough damage off the board to even survive next turn with what he has in his hand we can take the White Terror off with one Doom Guard. Yeah, that's true. He's uh, but then he won't. He is going to sack the other Doom Guard. Yeah, but then he, he's not going to have enough damage to win in this in this scenario. Because there's I don't think there's a way that he's going to be able to do a, um, 11 from hand. Let's see. That's, that's 19 for Ecop. Yeah, it's not quite there. Um, and he's thinking... What's the only way that I could lose in this scenario? Is if he doesn't clear. But it's actually pretty tough for him to clear. Because the only way for Dog to win is if he draws into Power Overwhelming, taps, and gets a second Power Overwhelming. So they have to be his next two cards. Yeah, he's going to open the favorable juggles here. And even I then, I, I don't think it's possible. Oh, it is possible, but it's just very unlikely. Oh, he could have... Uh... We got some good juggles there. Can't play the Dire Wolf. Of course, because... Nope. Be that <laughs> Implosion. That's not going to really help him. Implosion face won't even do it. Even if you uh, could. Yeah. So, Eco, going to take 
actually talking about mirror match and as you said, those zoo mirrors can be very, very interesting in ECOP, but with those mid-range threats, the Sylvanas, the Void Terror, the Alter Boom, ECOP was really able to take over into the mid-game there, and that's that's really what meant that he was able to seal that out. Yeah, and again, the misplay didn't really matter in the end, the misplay with the Siege Giant turn, uh, because regardless, ECOP already had those double power warmings in his hand, so he would have been able to take it out uh, and be able to activate one of the eggs, so, just rough stuff. But again, uh, that's one of the benefits of going up 2-0 in the series in Conquest. You play the same deck three times, and you just have to take one win. And this Zoo deck doesn't really have too many really poor matchups. Uh, it's got poor matchup against Face Hunter. Um, it, it can struggle against Freeze Mage as well. Um, but as far as like really poor matchups where it just gets absolutely destroyed, there, there isn't many decks that can do it. Uh, so he's saving that deck for last as sort of his ace. It's actually a pretty good strategy because he knows that if he does get wins with his first two decks, even if he just has two opportunities with that zoo deck to get a win, he'll most likely be able to do it. And yeah. I like that strategy that Doc went in with this, with the, his lineup choices, with the order that he played his decks. Well, he kept going to be switching back to the Paladin here. Obviously, we know Doc has to stick with that Warlock deck to win. But uh, Eco going back to the Paladin, we're not going to see his Mage deck yet. Uh, we may well see that if he gets a win with the Paladin here. But uh, Paladin versus Zoo, that can be an interesting matchup. It depends how the Paladin draws, obviously. But if he can get that, that strong mid game again with things like Dragon Corn Sword, uh, he can really, really make an impact in the mid game. Yeah, and I think this matchup is actually really tough for Paladins. Um... It, it's so hard for them to deal with the board because every turn that a Paladin usually has a, a swing play, the Warlock has a stronger play. So um, they the Warlock needs to draw poorly and the Paladin basically needs to draw into their really valuable early drops like Zombie Chow and Shielded Minibot in order to have much of a chance. By the time a turn where they can Equality and Consecrate comes around, they're usually already too far behind for them for the, for them to be able to pull themselves back into the game. And now with cards like uh, Imp Gang Boss coming out on turn three, usually Consecrate plays by themselves aren't very strong against Paladin anymore or against Warlock as a Paladin anymore. So uh, having to just hero power on that turn is pretty rough because he's... Oh, there's a Zombie Chow. So that's something at least. Yeah, it's not bad being with Zombie Chow and Hero Power on turn 3, but it's definitely not great. He's going to survive to turn 4 and have that Senjin. That's definitely going to help him. Going first is really, really crucial here. If Ecop was going second, he would definitely be a lot further behind. But yeah. We'll see what he rolls on this explosion. Oh, perfect, perfect. Killing it. And killing the 1-1 one -one with, the, with the juggles as well. That's, yeah. uh, this is a pretty early lead for Dog here. You can see Ecop already thinking... <laughs> This matchup is not going entirely to plan. Yeah, see, this is just one of the reasons why this matchup is just so hard for Paladin. Because like I said, there's just so many power plays that Warlocks can make. And it's not like they only have one. It's not like Knife Juggler Implosion is their only power play. If he was able to hide an Imp Gang boss behind like that Void that Void Walker, um, and then be able to Implosion, something like that, where he has to like force out a Consecrate to clear, but the Consecrate also summons imps from the Imp Gang boss. A situation like that where against most classes, you'd be able to True Silver and um, be able to make a big swing play, be able to clear off a, a powerful minion, just isn't possible because the Void Caller yeah. came out early on. So he's he's already at such low health. He's going to try and Dragon Consort, but I mean, what's he going to be? A, the, the effect that he's going to have with that Dragon is not going to oh, be that man. great. How much, how much time is he staring down? He's staring at 9, 4, 13. Dog is not far away from being a key cop here. And Truth yeah. Over, as you said, is just absolutely useless here. It's going to just take out this Void Walker. That's not what you want to use it for. This yeah. is a really tough spot. If he gets perfect juggles, I think he can actually do 16 damage this turn on face. Um, of course, it looks like he's going to uh, implosion here because he's clearing off to make room for his inevitable at least three imps. Um, oh, gets a two. But that's still juggles, which is a pretty big deal. He's going to get extra juggle from the Art of Squire as oh. well. 
I mean, this is still, he's still going to be able to bring him below 10 health this turn with a power overwhelming sitting in his hand. So it's looking very good for Ecop. I don't even know if he can draw into anything that's going to help him come back. No, I mean, even anti heal ball would just be prolonging the inevitable here. Um, I think he's, yeah, he's going to play the true silver. Um, I just take the, the knife juggler off the board, probably. Yeah. You can't really clear the aim gank boss because you're taking away one damage. You're taking away two damage, but you're still spawning an imp, so essentially you're only taking away one. <clears throat> and that's going to be it. And <laughs> Ecop, bold move for bringing the, the dragon paladin with the new dragon consort, but it's just a little too slow to be able to deal with decks like Zoo and decks like Facehunter. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right talking about the strategy of Dog, the way he left the Zoo to last, because it was a deck that was probably going to be easiest for him to get a win against really anything he was going to face. Uh, not like, not really knowing even what Ecop was going to play, leaving the Zoo to last. It has the better matchups uh, across the board than other decks, perhaps. Um, and a really, really strong strategy for Dog. So we're going to see uh, Dog in the next round. He's going to be playing uh, Jab in the next round. We're going to see him again tomorrow. A um, little bit longer series that time, which is good. So we're, we know what we're doing in terms of uh, coming to our next game. But what is the game we have coming up next for you? Well, the next game coming up next is going to be Tempo Storms hyped versus Fanatics Fraser, and that's I, I have I've been taking uh, lessons from my friend Kaldi on how to pronounce the name correctly. So it's Fraser, Fraser, Fraser. I don't yeah. know. I still never Kaldi, get it right. Kaldi gave me lessons too, and he I was pronouncing his name wrong. It's it's not Kaldi. He was saying he was telling me it's Kaldi, like the the D I in distance. Okay. And uh, it's that's really hard for an American to say ending ending a word on like a soft vowel is like one of the hardest things because it just feels so unnatural but i tried my hardest to make sure that i was pronouncing that correctly um called it oh, see it, it feels weird but yeah uh dogs um deck choices coming into that matchup i thought were probably the three strongest decks currently um he brought oil rogue he brought uh that zoo lock the demon zoo lock and he brought uh, Freeze Mage, which I think those three decks, uh, maybe with um, mid-range Druid thrown in, in in place of perhaps the Oil Rogue, could be a good lineup as well. But I really like the the deck choices from Dog. I think he's with those deck choices, he's probably going to go pretty far. Um, but again, we'll have to see. Um, the it's going to come out through. I think the semi quarterfinals start tomorrow, plus the semifinals and the finals start Sunday. So throughout the weekend, we'll have to see how he does. Um, now, as far as Temple Storm hype versus Fanatics Frezar, uh, hyped is I think one of the best players in the world who hasn't really had a huge breakthrough performance. Uh, Frezar, I believe, is sort of in the same same boat. He had that huge run through the I believe the European BlizzCon qualifiers where he yeah, exactly. almost made it all the way. Uh, at, it was at DreamHack. Um, but he fell. So he, he, the, both these players are sort of in the same position where they've made it really far, but they haven't had that one turn in performance that pushes them over the edge. So it should be should be really good. These are also going uh, to the quarterfinals of Dreamhack Summer last year, uh, coming through the qualifiers. So certainly a player who is worth watching. Height currently in the top position of the uh, Horde group of the KPL by virtue of having played one more game than uh, Life Coach. He's sitting at 5-2. and two right now, which is a pretty good record consistently over seven weeks. And uh, for Arnold doing as well in the KPL, he's uh, I've one in five right now, I did finally pick up his first win a couple of weeks ago. So he's going to be looking to make a statement here to show that maybe a little bit better than his performances in the KPL have shown. Uh, but we're going to take another break and we'll be back with you in 10-15 minutes and we'll bring you our next game, which we said is going to be Hyped versus Frazar. Don't go anywhere.